This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk to you about how you can plan, dream, hope for the future, and that there is a future worth living in for you, your family, your loved ones, despite the fact that you and I have now entered the greatest time of crisis since the world began. We are in the middle, not in the middle, but we're in the initial stages of the greatest spiritual battle in the history of mankind. And one in which the Bible predicted the days that we live in, and we do live in the last days, by the way. The Bible predicted that the days we live in would be very much like the days we are living in. The signs of the times of Jesus Christ um, are being fulfilled all around us. And there are so many prophetic signs from Genesis to Revelation that clearly indicate that this is the latter part of the last days. So this program is going to deal with Bible prophecy and then how do you live or as Francis Schaeffer wrote in one of his books, and as many of you know, I consider Francis Schaeffer's <clears throat> uh, writings and teachings to have been the single most important part of forming my uh, biblical theology. Uh, he was known as the greatest evangelical uh, theologian of the last 150 years. And uh, <clears throat> he was a genius. He was a brilliant man. And, uh, but, he, but he wasn't pretentious or anything. And I had the privilege of uh, working and knowing very closely with members of the Schaefer family. Um, one particular individual who uh, I consider a treasured friend. And... Uh, so I had the opportunity to observe uh, the philosophy and teachings of Francis Schaeffer, let's say, from the inside and, at, and the outside. The tragedy is, speaking of Francis Schaeffer, if you've never read his books, even though he's an intellectual, um, his books are, I consider them simple to read. I remember... When I was in my counterculture days at the University of Missouri, having grown up in uh, as an atheist in New York City, I attended the University of Missouri, uh, where I majored in uh, filmmaking in a brand new field in altered states of consciousness. Uh, those are my majors, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm laughing right now to myself. Because, you know, when you have a public ministry which reaches millions of people around the world and you've been doing it for as many decades as I've done it, you get people, you know, there's a certain category of person which I really feel sorry for. It's This is going to be a side note, but, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. You may have observed this yourself, and, and maybe you haven't, so maybe what I'm about to share will be of great help to you. Uh, I wish somebody had shared what I'm about to share with you, with me, but nobody did. I had to figure it out myself. There are basically two kinds of people in this world. And, I, and by that, I don't mean in, in this particular case. I'm not talking about Christians versus non-Christians. Because what I've observed is that the two kinds of people I'm describing, uh, many of them, I, I would say as many if not more, I've met who call themselves Christians and maybe are born again. But their uh, emotional being, their psychological being, the, the choices of their will um, have not been redeemed by the Lord. I mean, you can get to heaven and still be a lousy person. But the two kinds of individuals I've met over the years fit into two categories. One type of person, and it could be male or female, it has nothing to do with race or ethnicity because it exists in all racial groups and ethnic groups. 
And it's it's an equal opportunity employer. So it's just as many female as males. Two kinds of people. So one kind of person is the kind of person that if they see somebody else succeeding or getting praise or favor or doing something or accomplishing a goal or making progress, it could be any number of positive things. If they observe somebody doing that, they they have a weird reaction. They become threatened. Somehow, if they're around you or around anybody and and that person is succeeding, is accomplishing goals or whatever, they become threatened, then they become angry, they become very jealous, and then they often seek to try to destroy or thwart or oppose or tear down or block or eradicate the success or the progress or the favor or the accomplishments. And it could be some petty little thing. I mean, I'm talking about I've worked in many areas in the business world and also in the world of ministry, and it exists in both. It's actually rampant in the world of ministry, uh, which makes it really disgusting because uh, you, uh, you, you, you don't expect it in, in, in the so-called Christian world because I, you keep naively thinking that, gee, people should be actually living under the lordship of Christ. You know, when the Bible says don't be covet, don't covet your neighbor's wife and stuff. Well, we're not necessarily talking about your neighbor's wife although that's obviously a problem for some people, or husband. We're talking about covetousness in general. Gee, that person has a nicer car than me. But we're talking about petty covetousness. So let's say uh, the boss laughs at your jokes and doesn't laugh at, uh, excuse me, the boss laughs at this other person's jokes but doesn't laugh at your jokes. Or this person got some acknowledgement or some award. It could be anything. It could be like, you know, they want a donut in in an office party. I mean, really, it gets down to that kind of level of pettiness. And so in two kinds of people in this world, there's one kind that is jealous, covetousness. They become angry, and they seek to strike out covertly or overtly and try to get that person. And you see that a lot if you're somebody who who is... uh, to one degree or another, a public figure, and you make statements and they, they, you know, are heard by large numbers of people all over the world or whatever, uh, that, that makes some people very mad. Oh, boy, they're mad. And here's the, and, and see, they fall into a satanic trap. I'm talking about Christian and non-Christian. All the energy they spend hating and trying to shut up the person who is succeeding or having favor or whatever, they become obsessed and consumed. They spend so much energy trying to minimize somebody else's success or growth or progress or whatever that that if they would stop spending their enemy stop spending their energy trying to suppress somebody else's success or favor or growth and simply transfer. That energy they're spending trying to shut somebody else down because they're jealous, if they simply took that energy, they simply turned it around, turned the wheel of their mind and heart around, and put that same energy into trying to achieve their goals or earn the favor that they have, they would, they, they would get the positive things like the success they want, the favor uh, the progress, the achievement of goals, the very things that, that they really want, they would be able to get. This is the irony of it. Because people generally aren't stupid, and even these people who are obsessed with criticizing other people, they're not stupid. But they choose to become petty, and if they simply just quit being, you see, they're committing a sin. Now, everybody commits sin. But there's a price tag to sin. So the price tag of being envious, jealous, covetousness, uh, hating the fact that somebody else is envy. Boy, that's a big one, envy. Um, 
the price tag of, of allowing those sins. And, and you know what? I'm, I know for a fact that I'm speaking to a bunch of you right now who are either listening for the first time or who you've listened for a while. And you're, unco- you're uncomfortable with, with a feeling that's growing over you, which is you didn't think this would happen, but you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, maybe, or simply maybe by your own conscience, because what I'm describing, the people I'm describing, fits the way you act a lot of times. And, and look, I'm not claiming to be holier than thou, okay? I've never met a person who hasn't done that occasionally. Okay, so so I'm no better than you are. But maybe I do it less. Maybe I do it far less. But the point is, I've been guilty of that in my life. Okay, so I'm, don't think I'm pulling a holier than thou, because I'm not. We've all done it. But some people do, it's a, it's a lifestyle for some people. That's what I'm talking about. And so what happens is it's a trap because all the energy you're investing in being jealous and envious of somebody else, if you simply put that energy into your own gifts and talents, which you obviously have because God gave them to you, you, you would begin to achieve the things that you were called to achieve. But because you're committing a sin, you know, there's a lot of emotional sins and willful sins. But because you're committing the sin of jealousy and envious envy and covetousness and hating your brother and sister and lying about them and stuff, because you're committing that sin, what happens is you you become literally supernaturally blinded by the darkness that you've chosen to walk in. And you can't see the simple fact that if you just repent of that sin, their attitudinal sins, and stop hating and being envious and jealous of somebody else, and start investing your energy in what God has told you to do, you could have everything that the other person has, or maybe different stuff, you see. But but you can't see that because you're committing a sin which is causing you to walk in darkness. Now, I know that there are people out there listening to me right now and that's you, and you know it's you. I'm not here to, 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 to you know, I'm not here to, 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 to uh, point my finger at you with self-righteousness. I'm just saying, if you want to have a fulfilled life, if you want to see your dreams come true, if you want the talents and abilities that God has given you to come to fruition, you need to get rid of you need for first of all, you got to admit that you're doing it. A lot of people, it's like a semi-conscious, subconscious thing. A lot of people are not quite consciously aware of how deeply ingrained this stuff is. And so I'm not saying that they're innocent. They're not innocent because deep down inside they are making a choice. But 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 it's, they're not quite full, because they're walking in darkness, they're not quite really aware to the degree they're trapped by it. Now people around them can see it. It's obvious to them. So my suggestion to you is is to, to to redirect your energies. Okay, so but but this is a very, very common problem among human beings and human nature. It's it's rampant in every business, it's rampant in every state, every country, it's rampant in uh, everywhere you go, and unfortunately it is in my opinion often the most rampant in Christian ministry circles. And, and let me throw something out to you. Any of you who have ever been involved in a Christian ministry that probably has, let's say, six or more, 12 people or more, or a church or whatever, and, or done something in the Christian world in terms of ministry, If you have any talent, gift, or ability at all, whether it's the gift of administration, singing, preaching, teaching, evangelizing, organizing, uh, teaching youth, I mean, it could be any, any, it could be doing video production, you know, whatever it is. Uh, You, if you've done that, you know what, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
the, the jealousy and the pettiness, which you wouldn't expect, is rampant. And you got to deal with it. I've been, I mean, I've taught at the seminary level. And you would think these seminary professors who, uh, you know, boast of their vast biblical knowledge, would some of it would rub off on them. But they're, they're, they were among the worst in my life experience because they're so jealous. Oh, my God. Just, it's sad. And at all the time they spend being jealous, they could, they could accomplish something. Anyway, so, so there's two kinds of people. The ones that are jealous and obsessed about other people. The Internet, by the way, has created a, a open venue for people who are trapped by, by pettiness um, to, to express it. Because you see, in the internet, there's all kinds of opportunities to to hide. And one thing you'll find that's almost universal about people like that, they hide, they give fake names. If they do give their real name, they hide really everything about their life. You You hardly know anything about them. Usually, everything is hidden. Because they operate in darkness. See, they, they're not willing to stand up in public in the light and say anything or do anything. They, they, they hurl shots at other people from, you know, hiding under fake names and stuff like that. Um, but, but here's the thing. So the Internet has all these opportunities for people who are essentially, they're losing in life big time. Now, I'm not calling them losers because I don't think God creates losers, but they've chosen to function as losers. It's not that they are losers. They've chosen to function as losers because instead of pursuing the gifting that they have, they spend all their time ripping somebody else apart. And and the Internet gives people an opportunity to do that because they can fake it on being anonymous. All right, enough on that. But that's one kind of person. You, you will meet that in any business, any environment. And it, 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 this goes back to Adam and Eve, the, this flaw in human nature, the type of people that are jealous, envious, and can't stand it when somebody else succeeds. And then on the other hand, you have the people who, when they see somebody else succeeds, they're happy for them. And they cheer them on, and they encourage them, and they uplift them, and they volunteer to try to help them. So, so the other type of person uh, is excited um, and, and wants to help. And, and it's genuinely joyful, not angry, but they're genuinely joyful and excited about the success or progress or favor that somebody else has. And now, those of you listening to me that you're not that way, you're the type that's angry and jealous, you, you you can't fathom that somebody else could be actually excited that somebody else is succeeding. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of people who are like that. You just decided to, to, to take the low road. Now, here's the thing about the people that are excited about somebody else's success and want to help people even get more successful and more progress, etc. They are people that usually are successful themselves, accomplish things themselves, make progress themselves, receive favor themselves. Almost every person I've met who's a person that gets excited about somebody else's success or progress or promotion or whatever, they themselves are people that achieve success, progress, and favor. You see how that works? So there's a law here. If you're going to be somebody who's envious, jealous, and angry because somebody else is succeeding, you're going to fail in life because you're trapped in a law of the kingdom. You're going to fail, and you're going to downward spiral. And if you succeed, it's going to be upheaval all the time. Now, if you're a person who genuinely is excited and, and, and turned on by somebody else's success, chances are you're already succeeding because you're adhering properly to the, to the laws of the kingdom. And um, those people, you know, 
They're, they're not petty. They're, they're, they're genuinely glad. But there's something about human nature. There's this huge percentage of people that are, get angry and are jealous and stuff. So the reason I brought this up was um, this is the two types of people, two types of human nature. And uh, notice in the Bible how often this scenario plays out. Notice how many times in the Bible that God anoints somebody and there's other people that are jealous. I mean, it's in story after story in the Old Testament. Joseph and his brothers, you know, uh, David and his brothers, and on and on and on, the jealousy. Uh, so this is a, 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 key flaw, a key flaw in human nature. And you would be wise if you, you, you gave up on it. But a lot of people don't. They go down with it. The whole life is miserable. So the point is, you can change the direction of your life. You have, to a large degree, you're in control of whether you use your God-given talents and abilities. And you can succeed or fail. And, and a lot of it has to do with attitudinal sins or attitudinal perspectives, which are outlined in the Word of God. So, um, every one of you that have ever succeeded at something, you know what I'm talking about. The petty jealousy and all the rest of that stuff. And you got to ignore it. Uh, because those people... Um, Some of them will change. Many don't. And they'll be that way uh, for the rest of their lives. And then they can't, then then they're miserable and they cannot figure out why, why they're not blessed or whatever. Because they're not, you know, reason why is because they're not willing to be honest with themselves. That's why they stick it in their subconscious. They're not willing to be honest with themselves and admit that that's what they're all about. And, and if they would do that, before the Lord and change the, the way they process uh, other people's achievements and being used, their whole lives, they, they would see the blessing of God released on their lives. But the thing that's most disturbing to me is the fact that it's so many Christians are guilty of this in ministry and stuff. So back to Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Dr. Francis Schaeffer, most prominent Christian evangelical theologian in the last 150 years. But tragically, his books were brilliant, and they had huge impact on me. When I was in the counterculture, oh, I, I know what, I, I veered off course here. Um, when I was majoring, uh, had a dual major at the University of Missouri, altered states of consciousness within the psychology department and then filmmaking, you get these people, this person accused me, uh, on the internet, made a big deal about it. I lied about it. Oh, really? I lied about going to the University of Missouri and majoring in filmmaking and psychology and altered states of consciousness? Oh, really? I lied about it, huh? Well, then, then how did I get entrance into a master's program where I had to supply my uh, grades and my academic record from the University of Missouri of which there is a clear record, even though I attended decades ago, there's a clear academic record that proves that those are my areas of study with with my grades on them. And that's not secret. But you see, the people who, who are jealous and in darkness and covetousness, they twist the truth, they lie and say, Oh, well, I tried to get the information, and the person I talked to on the phone didn't, uh, said they never heard of such a thing. I mean, really, wake up out of your fantasy world. Do you know how many decades ago uh, I attended the University of Missouri? It was decades and decades and decades ago. And, you know, if you used your brain, you'd figure out they didn't have computers back then. And you're talking to a student 
who's probably 21 or 22 years old, and you're asking about the college records of a guy who, who went to this school like 40 years ago, before there were computers, the Internet, and all the rest of that stuff. So, I mean, what did you expect to hear? Now, if you really did your homework, those records are readily available. So, you know, the, the burden's on you. you. I mean, it's like people say, oh, you did this, you didn't do this. I got, I got pictures and photographs and videos of just about everything I've done in my life. And half of it is up on the Internet, or more than half. So I, um, I recognize this stuff. It's, you know what? It's part of the price. Part of the price... Every person has a choice. If you're going to succeed or achieve goals or do anything in life, you're going to get a bunch of people who don't like you. Why? Simply because you did something. And, they, and, and what it really comes down to, they haven't done anything except criticize you or whoever else they're going to criticize. That's really what it comes down to, jealousy. What it's really all about has nothing to do with the argument that they're making has nothing to do with the criticism they're making or, 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 or whatever. It always has to do with the fact that they have not used their gifts and their talents and they failed and they haven't done anything with their gifting. They're frustrated and they're angry. And the fact that somebody else actually did something makes them furious. So they, they, they use all kinds of subversive attempts to try to uh, attack or belittle that person, which is what a petty person does. Instead of just saying, hey, why don't I cut this nonsense out and actually look at my own life and spend my energy going after the dreams that God put in me? But no, they won't do that. A lot of people won't do that. And so they're stuck in misery. So with Francis Schaeffer, he was one of the greatest theologians in the even no, he was the greatest theologian in the Christian community uh, in, in the last 150 years. And he mentored my theology and stuff. And uh, I read his book at the University of Missouri when I was studying altered states of consciousness. Yes, yes, I was. Sorry to break it to you. And filmmaking. I still got the films. If you want to see the films, the films I have. And I actually have the grade records because I had to get them in order to apply for a master's program. So <laughs> I don't know what planet you're living on, but you, you can come back to Earth anytime you want. You don't have to stay in orbit around some moon of Saturn or something. So anyway, Francis Schaeffer was a brilliant man. And at the University of Missouri, I was a radical and a countercultural hippie the whole thing. I hated Christians, hated Christianity. And you can kind of wonder why sometimes, because I, the, 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 the amount of Christians who, who do the, the, the criticizing, it's like there's a disease out there. There's so many of them. Um, I uh, read his book, Escape from Reason, and it rocked my world. It's not a thick book. But Francis Schaeffer analyzed contemporary culture, films, movies, philosophy, the culture itself, in, in the clearest, most brilliant way I had ever read in my entire life. It was just brilliant. And I was shocked to find out that you could be a Christian and intelligent at the same time. Because, see... Uh, I, I had never met an, I haven't up until that time I've ne I never met an intelligent Christian. None of them had even the most third grade ability to, to to defend their faith and explain it. They were like illiterate. I'm, I'm not saying everybody's like that. That was my experience. So why why should I respect people where I never met anybody that that did their homework? And then after I accepted Christ and read Schaefer's books. And Schaefer, the Lord used Schaefer because I realized, gee, you can be intelligent and a Christian at the same time. And he gave me an intelligent defense of the faith. 
But over the years after that, after I accepted Christ, I must say that Christians, evangelical Christians, and this is not a pride thing on my part, so don't send me an email telling me I'm proud. Instead, spend spend your energy doing something good for the kingdom of God. I'm simply telling you the truth. I'm not going to lie to you about my experience or what went on. Um, the truth of the matter is, because the theology of the Christian church, and Francis Schaeffer addressed this in his books, um, there was a theologian named P.J. Spenner in the Christian church. I forgot how many years ago. I think it was like in the 1920s. I could be wrong. It's been a long time. But anyway, P.J. Spenner was called the father of pietism, and the pietistic movement uh, emphasized your own personal holiness, your own personal walk with Jesus Christ. So what Spenner did, he did some things good, because he emphasized the need that, you know, you have the Holy Spirit inside you and you walk with Jesus. That's good. No one's going to argue with that. But... He brought in a lot of baggage into the evangelical church. So by the time the evangelical church morphed the ideas of pietism, you know, John Wesley, my heart was strangely warmed uh, by the Holy Spirit, you know, personal experience. So, but the problem is the evangelical culture became personal experience oriented and then emphasized and prioritized personal experience and and then took it further that only personal spiritual Christian experiences were considered valid spirituality like if you went to Bible study or a prayer meeting or fasting or fellowship that was all Christian that was all holy that was all pure and the Bible doesn't teach that and so this caused the evangelical Christian culture to adopt a whole bunch of beliefs that are um, um, totally against the Bible and have crippled the, the, the influence of the Christian culture in our modern world. So instead of reaching people for Jesus Christ effectively, instead of making disciples of all nations effectively, instead of occupying the land of, until he comes effectively, the, the primary uh, thing in the evangelical culture is you're supposed to take care of your per, you know, personal holiness in terms of prayer, Bible study, fellowship, going to church, worship, singing in the choir, etc., etc., evangelism. And then, then they add on this, which is not in the Bible. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. That it's only those things, personal piety. It's only those things that are spiritual and everything else is worldly, like reading books, like being creative, like being an entrepreneur with a business, by going into politics. Everything becomes worldly, and the Bible doesn't teach this, because like I say all the time on this program, Jesus Christ is Lord of life, and not just of some uh, spiritual world. So if we, I use the analogy of like a pizza pie. So in the evangelical world, um, all of life is divided up into slices like in a pizza pie. And the slice that's spiritual is the, is the slice that deals with Bible study, prayer, church, worship, you know, stuff like that. And then the other slices in pizza pie that involve life, like economics, geopolitics, um, influencing the culture, sciences, art, or whatever. That's all non-spiritual. That's complete falsehood. There's no, that's, a, that's a total rejection of what God's Word says. So it's not only a theological error. It is a heretical teaching. And if you want to take it further in a precise theological definition, the false belief or the set of false beliefs held by most Christians, evangelical Christians, that life is compartmentalized. And even though they say Jesus is Lord, they they fail to say Jesus is Lord of all of life, 
They're implying that Jesus is Lord of only the spiritual world. And that whole teaching, which sprung from pietism, is one of the worst egregious examples of what the Bible calls false teaching and false doctrine. Yet you'll never hear anybody preach on that at all. It's like, it's like we never hear anybody preach on the, the, the character of Christ being creative. And not Christ, I mean God being creative. The creator. You'll never hear that. You'll never hear anybody preach on the sin of cowardice, yet it's the number one sin, according to the book of Revelation, that can keep you out of heaven. Being fearful and being a coward. Christian church is jam-packed with cowards and fearful people, but nobody ever preaches on it. So, when you have a biblical teaching which is directly opposing and contradicting what the Bible says, and the result of that false teaching is the total paralysis of the evangelical church and Christians in our contemporary world, which has the result of, instead of occupying the land like Jesus Christ commanded us to do, instead of doing kingdom business until he comes, as Jesus Christ told us to do, we're losing our nation, we're losing our children, eight out of kids from evangelical homes are walking away from their faith in Christ. That's a reality. Have a reality check. Uh, Instead of being influential in all these areas of influence, we have a theology which which creates what Francis Schaeffer called a Christian ghetto. And it's impotent in impacting America and the rest of the world. And that's why right now we are in a moral and spiritual freefall in America and other Western nations. Because the church has become, and why has the church become impotent? Ultimately, because it has embraced the false doctrine which says only pietistic spiritual things are worthy of our attention. And things like creativity and intellectualism, the Christian church is actually hostile towards creativity. Hostile. Hostile, just like the people, those two kinds of people, those that will celebrate and rejoice with you when you succeed or accomplish something. They're going to be happy for you. They're going to help you. And then you have another huge percentage of people that hate you for succeeding and resent you. So this plays out in the larger arena in evangelical Christians. Not only are evangelical Christians giving a false priority to just spiritual things, they are actually hostile, attacking, and um, entrenched in being anti-intellectual, entrenched in being anti-creative, entrenched in not producing people that can change culture, change lives, occupy until I come. In other words... In, in, to a large degree, this is called, you know, a mature conversation where we, where we talk like adults and tell the truth, not, not the, the, the shuck and jive routine. We tell the truth, which is the, the Christian culture is basically paralyzed at the time that it's, it's in the greatest, it's needed the most because the hour is so critical. And we have a lot of people talking, we have a lot of people who are self-anointed, self-called people who specialize in heresy and, and uh, exposing his prophets and stuff like that. And, you know, you, you need to evaluate people who are in any ministry, including my ministry. You need to evaluate the fruits of people, the doctrine of people, the history of people. My history is an open book. It's all over the internet. Well, most of the people who who are attacking people, they hide. You don't know anything about them. How many marriages, how many divorces, all the other stuff. The fact that there's no mature, prominent Christian leadership that will vouch for their ministries. Almost all of these people have almost nobody to vouch for their ministry, except for themselves. That says a lot. And 
they don't have their theology. There's, there's a dishonesty in their critique. There's, the, the, the critique is not motivated by genuine concern from the Holy Spirit. The critique is motivated by petty, uh, pettiness, jealousy, and the fact that somebody else has success and they don't have the success that they want. That's an impure critique, and God doesn't please the Lord. In addition, because, they're th- because they have not paid the price theologically, uh, fuck a big game, but... but that, that may impress people who don't know anything, but they they don't understand the, the more important and the bigger issues. And so um, some of the more important and bigger issues that should be addressed, which they, they don't even know that, that these issues exist, because they haven't studied. And how do you know they haven't studied? You look at who they quote. And who you're quoting is a very low-level source that tells something about the, the caliber of research. So uh, they're not quoting Francis Shea, for example. And so, uh, and they're not speaking the truth in love. And that's one, that's one of the major ways you discern whether somebody is from the Lord or not. Are they speaking the truth in love? Now, you can confront in love Speaking the truth in love doesn't mean you got to be all wishy-washy, but ultimately your purpose is to redeem and to help the body of Christ, not to not to destroy it. So um, nobody is raising up the truth that because the Christian evangelical Christian church is fundamentally anti-intellectual, anti-creativity anti-aggressiveness in participation in science, technology, uh, the arts, creativity, filmmaking, communications, etc., on and on, all the areas of influence, and and have adopted a retreatist position, the theology of retreatism. Um, Does that police God, the theology of retreatism? Who had the theology of retreatism? When God sent Joshua and Caleb into the promised land, they did not have a theology of retreatism. They obeyed God and they said, we are going to take the land. The cowardly, unbelieving spies had a theology of retreatism. When David's brothers were freaking out because Goliath was strutting back and forth, threatening, mocking, humiliating the armies of Israel and Saul and all David's brothers who were shaking in their boots, afraid to go against Goliath. You see this classic personality defect come into play. And let's just, let's just micro-focus on David and his brothers for a second. David and his brothers noticed that David was a shepherd boy. But he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, and he was called by God. So he went, he heard about Goliath and the Philistine army, and he wanted to help. Now, because King Saul and David's brothers and all the armies of Israel were hiding from Goliath and terrified in fear, retreatism, um, when David showed up, what was their reaction to David? Oh, great. Our brother, even though you know he doesn't have much experience on the battlefield, we rejoice that he's here to, to join us, even if we lose this battle. Was that their attitude? Excited that David came? No. The attitude of David's brothers was very much like the attitude of um, Joseph's brothers, who sold him into slavery. Why? In both cases, jealousy, envy of David's gifts, jealous of David's gifts, jealous and envious and resentful and hating David because he was gifted and because he was showing his giftedness and because he uh, was progressing and he was being successful. So the so so. David's brothers collectively, as as well as many of the mighty men of Israel, 
they decided to become the kinds of people that hate people that succeed, fill with resentment and hate, and try to sabotage other people's success. David's own brothers, and some of the mighty men of Israel. Why? What did David do? All David did was show up to volunteer to help them and keep them from getting slaughtered. So they mocked him, and then they accused him of impure motives, which is exactly what contemporary Christians do who are jealous of other people's success. So they use the same formula. Mock them, lie about them, they lied about him, they lied about his motives, they lied about everything. And said he was there, you know, for the wrong reason and everything. They put him down, and they attacked him viciously. And you will find that dynamic at work with Christians and non-Christians. Whenever, if you succeed in anything, if you get any acclaim, any awards, make any progress, there are those who are going to despise you for it. Just like David's brothers, just it's, it's, all, it's throughout the Bible. And so, David... King Saul was desperate, so uh, David rejected Saul's armor, and he went against Goliath. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He actually had the guts and the faith to declare very loudly in front of all of the armies of the Philistines and Goliath and all the armies of Israel, David thundered into the face of uh, Goliath with the, the Philistine army behind him, David shouted with total cons- how dare you defy the armies of the living God. See, that, that's a man of faith and boldness. Notice that people that are angry and jealous of other people's success and spend all their time criticizing him and ripping him apart, they are not people of boldness. They're people of cowardice. They're, 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 they're so cowardly, they're, they're afraid of even letting you know what their name is or anything about them. Because they're cowards. They're fearful. And cowards and fearful people, especially in the body of Christ, resent and hate people who have faith and are bold. They hate them. Why? Because the boldness in, exemplified in men and women who have faith and courage, and are doing something for the Lord, it exposes the pettiness, the fearfulness, the coward, the cowardliness of the people who resent anybody who does something. That's why it happens. It's a human dynamic. So, David gets out there, takes his slingshot, drops Goliath and cuts off Goliath's heads, and single-handedly, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, David turns the battle. The Philistine army flees, and Israel is victorious. Now, do you think David's brothers ran over to him and apologized? I, I don't know. I wouldn't count on it. So that's an example of a man who uh, didn't allow the hatred and jealousy and mockery and the lies told about him to stop him from what God told him to do. Same thing with Joseph, whose brothers were jealous and sold him into slavery. And it's a common thing. So, let's go back to the book of Revelation. When the book of Revelation talks about those people who will not enter the kingdom of heaven, again, we have one of these oxymorons in Christian theology that the seminaries embrace, the Christian churches embrace. And, and, the, and the basic theological flaw is what it always is. Just like being anti-intellectual, which is completely against God's word, just read Proverbs. When we read the book of Revelation, we see, and this isn't even interpreted properly by most people who read it, But it's something you need to be familiar with, and I'm going to read it to you right now. In the book of Revelation, thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, but I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, 
and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, the way that 99% of all evangelical Christians, well, I can't say 99% of Christians interpret this because that would be a big mistake on my part because 74% of evangelical churches forbid the teaching of Revelation. So they don't even read this passage. (laughs) I'm laughing. I should be crying. So whatever percentage of people who are God's people who actually read the book of Revelation and to earlier generations of Christians um, that did read the book of Revelation, they would always misinterpret this. Notice carefully that the sins which are being listed that are keeping you out of heaven and guaranteeing that you're going to be sent to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the lake of fire. Notice the the numerical order of the sins. And I believe this reflects God's priority. So I think it's a prioritization by God of the sins. So the very first sin listed is not the one that Christians list. What Christians, the very first sin that's listed is the cowardly. The cowardly or the fearful will not, they'll, they'll go into the lake of fire. They won't get into heaven. So God's high priority is over the cowardly or the fearful. And yet I have never heard, and I'm not, just, I'm, I'm not saying this to boast, besides myself, I've never heard anybody preach a sermon on the sin of cowardice in relationship to these other sins and fearfulness. Never. And what I do hear is I hear Christians cherry pick the order of sins and rearrange it to their own suiting where they always talk about the sexually immoral and then they identify certain sins under the umbrella of sexual immorality, but they especially delight in in being able to point the finger at people outside of the Christian community who they perceive are, are, are uh, guilty of select uh, sins under the category of sexual immorality, and they blame them for the judgment of God on our nation and stuff. They're not getting this from the Bible, and they're not even getting the, the, the order of priority from the Bible. The very first sin is the cowardly or fearful. The second sin is the unbelieving. The unbelieving of what? The unbelieving of God's word, not only regarding salvation, but regarding all of God's word. Because whatever you, whenever you don't believe God's word, you're under a curse. So those are the first two priorities. And by the way, forbidding the teaching of revelation and forbidding the teaching of um, uh, prophetic passages in the scripture, that fits into the unbelieving, because you're not believing God's word, which says at the, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, there's a blessing and curse, and at the end of the book of Revelation, it talks about a blessing. If you read and teach the book of Revelation faithfully, you will be blessed. If you change or alter the words of the book of Revelation or fail to teach it and censor it, you'll be under a curse. That's called unbelieving. So, the first sin is if you're a coward and fearful, you won't get into heaven. The second thing is if you don't believe God's word, which says, I'm paraphrasing, your name will not be written in the book of life if you don't teach the book of Revelation, if you don't teach it accurately, or if you change its meaning. But I'm believing. So God's priority here is very clear. Um, Cowardice or being afraid is the first category of sin that will keep you out of heaven. Then, in order of priority, priority, it's unbelieving, God's word, the vile, that can be a lot of sins, the murderers, that's, I guess, self-evident, the sexually immoral, but see, that's towards the end of the list, but the Christians place it at the top of the list. Because it suits their self-centered 
um, cultural interpretation. Uh, those who practice magic arts. Now, magic arts is new age, sorcery, the occult, but it's also things like contemplative p- prayer, which is um, uh, being taught by the emergent church and many other churches. They're practicing all kinds of uh, prayer, which is really Eastern occultic New Age meditation. So, but it comes under the category of magic arts. Idolaters, well, an idolater is worshiping anything above God. And liars. May God have mercy on us all, because let me tell you something. Reading this, there isn't one of us, including myself, including any one of you, who can stand before God and say, I have not committed any of the sins in any of these categories. And if you say that, then I can guarantee you that you're, you're guilty of the last one, which is all liars won't enter the kingdom of heaven. We have all committed, either in thought or deed, more than once, one or more categories of these sins. So the, which is the point. The point is, how on earth can you possibly get in heaven if this is, if if you're guilty of any of these things, you you'll go to the lake of fire. How how on earth can anybody be saved? Well, that that's the whole point. What Christians do is they take Revelation twenty one and they teach it from a legalistic perspective. As if you can earn your way into heaven. I'm not talking about sloppy grace. I'm talking about real grace. But the fact of the matter is everybody, including you and everybody you know, including me, has one time or another committed one or multiple of these sins in thought, word, or deed. Okay? So, how do you get into heaven then? Because here it says, you do do any of this, you go into the lake of fire. Well, here's the answer that will set you free. You shall know the truth, that the truth will set you free. You can't take any passage or paragraph or several verses out of text and interpret the Word of God properly. The Word says we're to rightly divide the Word of God. That means we, the only way you can, if you, you, If you misread this, you're not rightly dividing the Word of God. You can't read these verses about liars and everybody else um, without reading the verses or any verses in the Bible. You can't take them out of context. You have to compare them and balance them and integrate them and relate them to all the other applicable passages of Scripture that deal with, with the same subject or subject. That's called rightly dividing the Word of God. And we know in numerous places in the New Testament and places in the Old Testament that, the, that nobody can get into heaven through good works. That's the fundamental law. So if we're trying to do good works, which means we're trying not to commit any of these sins, that's not how we get into heaven. We're saved by faith and not of works. We're saved by grace alone. Salvation comes through faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. What did Jesus Christ do for us? Well, he died on a cross, the Lamb of God. He took upon himself all the sins that you and I committed and anybody else committed. Let's read some of them. And I want you to think of yourself right now. And I'll think of myself. And it says this, And as I'm reading to you these sins, I want you to think of the fact that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for these sins for you when he died on the cross. Therefore, you don't have to go to the lake of fire, as it says at the end of this passage, because Jesus died and paid the penalty for the sins when he died for your sins and you 
when he took the penalty for your sins on the cross. So in light of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, I want you to think of yourself, and when I name the sins, ask yourself, did you ever commit in thought, word, and deed any of these sins? But then at the same time, think, thank God Jesus Christ took the penalty of this sin uh, for me upon the cross. So let's read this again. Revelation 21. Um, he, 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. Now, how do you overcome all these sins, by the way? Faith. Faith in Christ. Faith in what he did for you on the cross. So it says, uh, He who overcomes will inherit all, all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, now think about it. I, think about whether you ever were a coward or thought about being a coward or, or was a coward or fearful. And I'll go down the list. But every time you think of the sins or whether or not you did them, I want you to remind yourself that Jesus Christ died for you. He paid the penalty for that sin for you on a cross. So let's go through the list. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, on one level, God's word is telling us right now, if you committed any of these sins, you're going to hell. Aha! But you're not supposed to take the word of God out of context. You have to take this very indicting series of verses and relate it to the other passages of Scripture. And that is that Jesus Christ died for all those sins that you may have committed in that list or others, in thought, word, or deed. He took the full penalty for you so that you don't have to go to the lake of fire, that you will enter into eternity forever and ever in heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you have been cleansed. If you, if you, but you must do this. You must put your faith in Jesus Christ. You must put your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you. So if you put your faith in the fact that Christ died for you on the cross and took the full penalty of all your sins on the cross, that he paid the penalty for your sins, and that he has cleansed you by his blood of all those sins, including the ones we just read, that you are now sinless and holy. Despite what you did, Christ paid it for you, so God sees you as sinless and holy. Holy. So you put your faith in that. You put your faith and invite Christ into your life to become born again. And that your old man or woman is dead. Your new man is, or woman has been purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You invite Christ into your life to make you born again. And you're not going to the lake of fire. See? Even if you were a coward, you can be spared judgment of, of the cowardice So that's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news, because, man, nobody would make it. And for those of you, or people you know, who, you know, I was talking about two kinds of people, those who are jealous and angry and hateful and covetousness and envy because the Lord uses you, or you've done something, or you succeeded, or have favor, or whatever, like David's brothers. God, if you repent of your sins, you got to repent of your sins, though. Ask God for forgiveness. He'll cleanse you with his blood of all those sins. And that's wonderful. But most Christians I know read this, and they don't, they don't, they're not rightly dividing the passage they're acting as if everybody who is in all of these sins are going to hell and there's no way they can get into heaven. Where on earth did you get that idea? Why did Christ die on a cross? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believeth on him and should not perish but have an everlasting life. Anybody who has committed those sins, 
including you and me, in thought, word, or deed, does not have to go to hell. We can go to heaven by simply putting our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and putting in our faith that we can be saved through Christ by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Wow, that's freeing stuff, man. I, I, don't, I don't know you. if that doesn't set you free. I don't know what would or what could. You, you are free indeed. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. We'll be back in just a second. By the way, visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. You know, one of the best things you can do, um, I believe, during the holiday season is when you give a gift, <clears throat> give a gift to somebody that will change their lives or bring them into eternal life. And um, there's many ways you can do that. And you have many choices. But, you know, God gives us all X amount of money to spend on whatever. And um, I'm not here to discuss, you know, the, the validity of Christmas. and the, 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 I mean, it's obvious uh, the problems regarding Christmas in terms of it not being biblical. But the fact of the matter remains people give gifts at this time so since people give gifts at this time why not give a gift that can bring truth to somebody Um, give them uh, lead them to Christ give them biblical truth or shine the light of Christ in their lives and so we offer at Paul McGuire Ministries we've got a great discount right now on a lot of books that would help a lot of people, even believers that need help. Um, Books like Prophecy of the Future of America, which talks about the Illuminati music videos, the the root behind that, the Nazi mind control scientists who came to the U.S. during Operation Paperclip, the plan uh, for America. It also talks about the vision that I had on July 4th, 2012. And I'm very, I don't use the word vision casually. I I only claim to have had one vision because I try to be precise in my definitions and I distinguish between a a vision from God and let's say an inspired imagination or a thought that the Lord may inspire. To me, that's completely different than having a vision. So again, I'm very careful about the precision of my words, but on July 4th, 2012, I had a vision regarding America and what God had in mind for America, and I detail that in the book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, which has got a lot of, it's a very fast read, deals with contemporary subjects in in a high-powered way, and it would make a great gift for people. Also, Mass Awakening, where I talk about, just got an email yesterday from somebody who was blown away by Mass Awakening, because it talks about the reality that there are social engineers, etc., that are trying to activate a dark Mass Awakening a satanic mass awakening, and they're very busy at it. They're using occultic principles and science, technology, mind control. And on the other hand, when God's people seek the face of the Lord, God can activate a mass awakening. We call that a great awakening. Our nation birthed as a result of the first great awakening. And we can have a third great awakening, a biblical one, now, if God's people will turn to him. And so Mass Awakening explains the dynamics of each and how it can happen. And that we're, we're, God puts it in our corner. It's not like fatalism. And then the book, uh, Conquering the Matrix, which deals with scientific mind control. And it will, if you want to know if you're under the influence of scientific mind control or some kind of hypnotic state or whatever, you can discover it by reading the book. You can learn how to protect yourself and others. 
you can learn how to set people free from scientific mind control because this kind of thing is, is unfortunately, it's now a pervasive technological scientific weapon being used in societies all, all across the planet. And then, of course, if you want to delve into the beginnings of all this stuff, you can read the Babylon Code, um, which talks about the, the coding system in ancient Babylon that's still used by secret societies today. And the book is completely biblical and is centered on Bible prophecy and the scripture. And the Babylon Code I wrote with my co-author, Troy Anderson, a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist. And then we have our book that's still making waves everywhere from Washington, D.C. to all across the country. Christian Leaders, it's like the number one selling prophecy book in the world right now, according to Amazon. And that is the book, uh, Trumpocalypse. So you can either get the books at paulmcguire.us or you'll be directed on how to get the books. We also have tons of free videos. Uh, the Paul McGuire Report video version at paulmcguire.us. Uh, we've been re- releasing brand new videos, lots of them. We have uh, the Paul McGuire Report radio archive you can listen to for free. All of this stuff is for free, the media stuff. And uh, we have the Roku channel up and running with me speaking at Bible prophecy conferences and uh, teaching Bible prophecy. We have, uh, oh, we got tons of stuff. And we have a brand new video series that will be out that deals with uh, American um, mind control and how the science of mind control is being used increasingly and what you can do about it. And, and it's powerful. And I think it'll rock your world for the good. Anyway, visit paulmcguire.us for more information. That's paulmcguire.us. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. <laughs>